41-year-old Paul Fugate was a law enforcement park ranger at the Chiricahua National Monument, a unit of the National Park Service located in the mountains of southern Arizona. On January 13, 1980, he was the only permanent staff member working at the visitor center. Sometime between 2 and 3 p.m. that day, he told his lone co-worker, a seasonal employee, that he was going out to patrol some of the nature trails. He instructed the co-worker to begin closing down the center for the day without him if he was not back before 4.30. According to the co-worker, Paul left the visitor center without his radio, heading towards the trails that led to Faraway Ranch, a large area of land recently acquired by the Park Service. He never returned to the visitor center. The following morning, the park's superintendent called Paul's wife Dottie to tell her that he was missing. Search teams, canine units, helicopters, and small planes searched the area for Paul extensively with no success. Federal, state, and local agencies were involved in the investigation, but none of them found any sign of Paul. The Park Service offered a $5,000 reward for information about Paul's disappearance, and Paul's family promised to match that amount. Within a few years, this amount grew to $20,000. The initial assumption made by the Park Service was that Paul met with foul play. Paul's wife, Dottie, continues to hold this belief. Dottie believes that her husband happened upon some sort of drug deal out in the wilderness and was abducted in a panic when the dealers saw the badge on his uniform. The Park Service paid Paul's wife a portion of his salary as survivor's benefits when he first went missing. However, the director of the Park Service's Western Region, Howard Chapman, reviewed the case in 1981 and alleged that Paul had not gone missing, but had rather abandoned his post. He was therefore formally fired as a park ranger, and Dottie was ordered to pay back the almost $7,000 in payments she had received, plus 11% interest. She was told she could not appeal this decision because such an appeal had to occur within 20 days of an employee's termination, and Paul's termination had been applied retroactively to the date he disappeared, more than a year prior. It took Dottie five years of fighting before the National Park Service re-examined the case and had Paul listed as deceased rather than as a deserter in 1986. Dottie received all of the financial benefits she was entitled to. Paul's case was classified as a probable homicide by the Cochise County Sheriff in 1988. On June 19, 2018, the National Park Service tripled the amount of the reward in Paul's case, bringing it up to $60,000. They announced that they had new information in the case that inspired this renewed appeal to the public. They did not reveal what this new information was. The increased reward has so far not brought forth any answers in Paul's disappearance. Thelma Pauline Melton was known to her friends as Polly. The 58-year-old lived in an Airstream trailer with her husband, Bob. They lived in Jacksonville, Florida, but spent several months out of the year in Western North Carolina, where they shared a large rented campsite with friends just outside of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Peggy and Bob had only been married for six years, but Peggy herself had been coming to the area for over 20 years. On September 25th, 1981, Peggy and two of her friends from the campsite Trula and Red set out for a walk, which was fairly routine for the three friends. They left at approximately 3 p.m., walking along the Deep Creek Trail, which took them into the National Park. A quarter mile into the park, they went right at a fork in the trail that took them past a campground and picnic area. The group walked a mile past the campground before turning around, pausing so that Polly could smoke a cigarette. On the walk back, Polly suddenly began walking much more quickly and soon got ahead of her two friends. She disappeared out of Red and Trula's view over a small hill, and they did not see her again, even after reaching the top of the hill themselves. Assuming that Polly had just kept up her quick pace, they went to Polly and Bob's trailer when they got back to the campsite at 4.30. However, Bob told them that Polly had not come back, and that he had not seen her since she had left with them an hour and a half earlier. Bob began calling around to friends while Trula and Red retraced their steps on the trail and searched the campground. They did not find any sign of Polly. At 6 o'clock, Polly was reported missing to the park rangers. The park rangers were able to assemble a search team of 25 people to look for Polly that evening. The trail was later closed so that 150 people and a team of search dogs could search for her. That search went on for a week, but was unsuccessful. 
Polly was very familiar with the trail she had been on when she disappeared, and it was a fairly easy hike, so it was hard to imagine that she had gotten lost or off trail somehow. She was also reportedly terrified of snakes, so her friends did not believe that she would have willingly gone off trail. She was not in good health, but was just under six feet tall, so her friends believe that there would have been signs of a struggle on the trail had she been abducted. The most popular theory about Polly's disappearance is that she voluntarily walked away from her life and had made arrangements for someone to pick her up along the trail, which is why she had to walk ahead of her friends. The campground had been very busy the day she went missing, with 50 cars in its parking lot, so a vehicle would not have been suspicious in the area. Polly had lost her driver's license due to medical issues and as such did not carry a key to the station wagon she and Bob owned, which did not go missing with her anyway. If she left the area in a vehicle, another unknown person was involved. Polly's pastor provided some insight into who that other person could be. According to the pastor, Polly had made statements to him that he believed indicated that she was having an extramarital affair, although she never said so outright. He also revealed that Polly had a history of mental health issues, which were largely situational and seemingly under control by 1981. However, in addition to her own health issues, Polly was also dealing with the medical conditions of her husband. Bob was 20 years older than Polly and in declining health. The stress of caring for him could have been a motive for Polly to become involved with someone else and choose to run away with them. During her time in North Carolina, Polly volunteered at the Presbyterian Nutrition Center, where she served meals to the elderly. The day before she went missing, Polly had not signed up at the end of her shift to volunteer the following day, despite the fact that she normally worked every weekday. Furthermore, according to the center's supervisor, Polly had asked to use the phone several times that day. In the four years she had been volunteering there, she had never previously used the center's phone. Police could not trace who Polly called, but they did know that the calls Polly made had to be local, as no long-distance charges were made to that phone line. It is possible that Polly made these calls to arrange being picked up the following day inside the park. The idea that Polly ran away to start a new life with someone else is undermined by the fact that she left with nothing more than her cigarettes. If she really wanted a fresh start, however, she may not have wanted to take possessions from her previous life, no matter how practical it would have been to take them. The one potential exception to this rationalization, however, would be the prescription medicines she was taking for high blood pressure and nausea, which were left behind. Polly's husband Bob was so upset by his wife's disappearance that he had to be admitted to the hospital the night she went missing. In 1982, Bob, with the help of his sons from a previous marriage, sold the Airstream trailer he had shared with Polly and went to live in a nursing home. Polly Melton has never been found. Joseph Wood Jr. was an accomplished 34-year-old journalist from a close-knit family in the Bronx. He graduated from Yale with honors in 1990 and had received a grant that allowed him to travel to Ghana to write his first book. Back in New York, he began working as a writer and editor at The Village Voice. In 1996, he left The Village Voice to take a job at The New Press. By 1999, he had also begun work on a new book about the African-American family. On July 7th of that year, Joe traveled to Seattle for Unity 99, a conference for minority journalists. At the first Unity conference at Atlanta in 1994, Joe had met Sumini Sengupta, a reporter for the New York Times. The two had become romantically involved and had lived together for several years, but had broken up at the beginning of 1999. They saw each other briefly at the opening ceremonies for the 1999 conference. That night, Joe had dinner with friends and mentioned to one of them that he was planning to visit Mount Rainier National Park the following afternoon to do some bird watching after attending a press breakfast with presidential hopeful Bill Bradley. Joe had loved the outdoors since he was young, progressing through Boy Scouts until he achieved the rank of Eagle Scout, so these plans were very much in line with his interests. Joe was not at any of the conference events from July 9th onward, something his many friends took note of but were not initially concerned by. When Joe failed to return to New York on July 11th, however, Sumini Sengupta began making inquiries into where he was. Having no luck getting a hold of Joe, or finding any information about where he might be, she formally reported him missing, and hired a private investigator. 
The private investigator learned of Joe's plans to visit Mount Rainier from the friend he had talked to at dinner the night of the 7th. Authorities located Joe's rented Mercury Marquee in the Longmire parking lot inside of Mount Rainier National Park. A receipt inside of the car revealed that he had entered the park at 1229 on July 8th. A search for Joe began, but there was a massive area for the search team to cover. The biggest break in the case came on the morning of July 15th, when a man named Bruce Gaumond contacted authorities. Bruce had seen an article about Joe's disappearance in the newspaper and came forward with the last known sighting of Joe. Bruce had been hiking on the Rampart Ridge Trail on the afternoon of July 8th. There, he ran into Joe, who was on his way up, while he himself was on his way down. At the time, they were at an altitude of roughly 4,800 feet. The two men chatted about the birds they had seen for a few minutes, and Joe asked Bruce about how much farther he could expect to go up the trail. Bruce advised him that he could only go on for another five or ten minutes before encountering a snow bridge that did not look sound. Bruce then continued back down the trail, and Joe continued up, after assuring Bruce that he would be turning around soon. While Bruce's statement was the high point of the investigation, because it helped narrow down the search area, the search teams quickly ran into even more problems. Snow and ice were a major issue in the search for Joe. While he had gone on his hike on a warm July day, Mount Rainier had experienced unusually heavy amounts of snow over the winter. Joe had been hiking on packed down snow at the altitude he was last seen at, and much of it had melted over the several sunny days following his disappearance, leaving no tracks for searchers to follow. The warm weather ended on July 16th, when heavy rains brought in cooler temperatures. With the search now being much more dangerous in these conditions, many of the members of the search team were not able to continue on for the day. On July 18th, the National Park Service announced that they were scaling back the search for Joe. Park rangers explained to Joe's family that they believed that he had suffered some sort of accident. When Bruce Gauman saw him, he was wearing a light shirt and did not seem to have any provisions or equipment with him beyond his binoculars and birdwatching book. Even if he had remained alive but immobile somewhere on the mountain, he would have almost certainly fallen victim to hypothermia when the rains and cold temperatures rolled in. In the absence of Joe's remains to prove this theory, Joe's parents have not ruled out the possibility of foul play in his disappearance. Park rangers dismiss this possibility, arguing that if Joe had been in a struggle with someone on the mountain, it would have resulted in scent trails that the dogs used in the search would have picked up. Joe's literary agent raised money amongst Joe's friends to hire a former NYPD detective to work on the case after the search was scaled back. Despite these efforts, no sign of Joe has ever been found.